Perfect. Okay. So, okay. all right. So the next speaker is Jerome Dubai, and he's going to tell us about atom atom losses. Uh, yes, okay, so thanks a lot to the organizers for this conference. Uh, thanks to the ICTP for hosting it and, and thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, so this is going to be about um, atom losses and it's, uh, it's uh, based on a preprint that we just uh, put on the archive a few days ago with uh, Benjamin uh, Doyon and uh, Isabelle Bouchou. Uh, can you see my pointer? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So uh, I'm I'm gonna start uh, very very slowly. So uh, imagine that we have some model for a for a gas uh, like two dimensional hard spheres, and um, initially the spheres are at rest, and and we kick one of the spheres. Um, so then what happens is that very quickly, uh, because of collisions, um, the energy and momentum that we have. Uh, put into the system is shared among all the degrees of freedom and so that after some short relaxation time uh, the the state of the system in inside the box is entirely characterized by by uh, a, a small number of quantities uh, here three quantities only so particle density uh, mean velocity and uh, mean energy per particle um, and um, so uh, in this talk, we are going to be interested in uh, losses. So that means that we, we have the same uh, system. So we uh, imagine we have, a, again, two-dimensional di two hard spheres. But now uh, some of the spheres can just uh, disappear from the system at some rate uh, gamma. So you see that some of the spheres get colored in blue, and shortly after, they, they, they just escape the system. So this is what we are interested in, in describing. And um, we are going to describe this in the regime where the where the loss rate gamma is uh, much smaller than the inverse relaxation time, so that the system always has time to relax. So after each loss event, the system uh, relaxes, uh, so that uh, and it it stays in a relaxed uh, state for for some long time uh, before the before the next uh, loss uh, occurs. And so even though in that st system, strictly speaking, the energy, momentum, and particle norm number are not conserved anymore, um, we, can still describing, we can still describe this as a system as at equilibrium. It's just that the, the state, the equilibrium state, is going to slowly drift as a function of time uh, here in that simple toy model according to these equations. Uh, but we'll see more, uh, more complicated equations later. So that's essentially the story of, uh, that we would have uh, for a gas with losses in, at equilibrium, uh, a gas that thermalizes. Um, but uh, we are going to be interested in an intercorporeal gas, uh, like uh, old systems in, in this conference. And so uh, what we have in mind is more something like this. So uh, imagine that now that we have hard spheres in, in one dimension, and uh, we, that we do the same uh, thought experiment. So we just kick one of the spheres. And then what happens is, is very different from what was happening uh, earlier, because now the energy and momentum is, does not, is not shared between all the particles. Uh, and instead, uh, as you can see here, at any time, there is one and only one uh, sphere that is moving. And the reason is that just uh, we have coll uh, elastic collisions in 1D. Uh, with identical particles, and so the only thing that can happen is that the particles uh, exchange their velocities. And uh, as a consequence, uh, it's not just the energy and momentum uh, of the particles that is conserved, but it's the entire uh, distribution of velocities of particles in the box. So this distribution of velocities, rho of v, is conserved at any time. So if you want to describe the system, you need to know this uh, distribution of velocities uh, at uh, time zero. And uh, just for the younger people in the audience who might, who might not uh, feel comfortable with this uh, expression, so this sum of Dirac deltas, this means that we have a sum of infinite peaks. But uh, when, as we take the thermodynamic limit, these uh, peaks become uh, more and more dense, and this becomes a, 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 smooth, uh, a smooth distribution. Another way to say this is that you can broaden the peaks a little bit, replace the delta function by a, by a, a Gaussian with sigma, for instance. And so uh, if you do that, then this expression becomes a, a smooth function, uh, like the, the one sketched in, in black here. 
And uh, this function gives you the distribution of velocities with some resolution uh, sigma. So the smaller sigma, the, the, be the, better, the, the better the resolution. All right. Now, um, again, we are interested in losses. Uh, and again, in this uh, regime where the loss rate is uh, much smaller than the inverse relaxation time. So some particles uh, can just escape the system uh, randomly with some rate, with the rate gamma. And uh, the point I want to make here is that this means that uh, our distribution of velocities uh, now is not conserved anymore, but that again, it's going to slowly drift as a function of time. So we, uh, we are going to have, in this simple toy model, we have just a simple, very simple equation of this form. So time derivative of rho is just uh, proportional to rho with a proportional, uh, proportionality constant that is directly the rate. Uh, but more generally in this talk, we will have a time derivative of rho that is proportional to some functional of rho at time t. Uh, so this is the important equation. This is uh, what we are going to see in this, what we are going to study in this talk. And of course, if, you, if we know that, uh, if we know the functional f, um, then we can then uh, calculate the time evolution of the rapidity distribution. So typically what will happen is that it starts, for instance, from this uh, violet distribution at t equals zero, and then it evolves with time, and ultimately it will just go to a constant uh, zero, simply because since we are losing particles in the system uh, at large times, the system will just go to the vacuum. So the big challenge is really to calculate this functional f uh, in general. Okay. So now uh, that's enough uh, toy models. Um, so now, uh, now I'm going to talk um, exclusively about the, the system that we are really interested in, which is the one-dimensional Bose gas. So it's described by this uh, Hamiltonian here, known as the Lieblinger Hamiltonian. Uh, so there's a kinetic term and a, a contact propulsion term. So when two atoms uh, are at the same position, there's some uh, positive uh, energy. And this uh, describes a gas of atoms, uh, for, instance, uh, for instance, in a box. And um, so that, that the Hamiltonian describes only the unitary part of the evolution. But what, what we want to do is to take into account uh, losses. So experimentally, um, what can happen for, uh, is that some, um, Depending on the on the on the conditions that you have, uh, some some at a packet, uh, sorry, several atoms can come to the same position, and because of collision, they can uh, form either some uh, internal excited state or or go or form a bigger molecule uh, that is uh, no longer trapped by the by the one-dimensional uh, confining potential, and uh, if this happens, then they can escape the system. So experimentally, um, usually the, the most important processes are with uh, three, body, uh, three body losses. But in, for the purposes of this talk, I can just consider uh, K body losses, where K is some arbitrary integer. So K equals one or two or three, uh, whatever. So I will just fix K. K is some integer that is fixed for the rest of the talk, and I will consider K body losses. So a good starting point to describe these losses is uh, this equation, so the Lindblad equation for the, for the density matrix uh, of the gas in the box. And uh, what's important here is that we have this unitary uh, part of the evolution generated by the Lieblinger Hamiltonian and uh, the, the loss processes that are encoded here by this operator psi to the K, which is the uh, operator that annihilates uh, K atoms at a, at a given position. And this occurs with some uh, constant g, which uh, has dimension of length to the k minus 1 divided by time. And uh, by multiplying this by the density to the k minus 1, I can form a, a rate, an inverse time, um, uh, gamma. So in the rest of the talk, I will use this notation gamma, again, for the, for the loss rate. Um, all right, now I, st I need to define uh, the rapidities because I have not defined uh, the rapidities yet. So Paula to also talked about the rapidities, but so essentially uh, these are numbers that appear when you, in the mathematical solution of the, of the, of the, of the Lieblinger model. So when you diagonalize the Lieblinger Hamiltonian, you find that the, uh, 
that the eigenstates take the form of beta states. Beta states are superpositions of uh, products of plane waves, and the numbers that parameterize those plane waves are homogeneous to velocities. Uh, and, uh, and those velocities we are going to call rapidities. So, um, okay, so mathematically the rapidities are just, uh, the set of rapidities is just uh, the, the label of, uh, of the eigenstates uh, of the Lieb-Linegar model, but uh, perhaps more physically you can think of, of, of those rapidities as being asymptotic velocities if you let the system expand uh, in 1D. So what you can do is uh, imagine that you prepare um, the gas in a, in a box, in a small box, uh, in, a, in some eigenstate with a label by the rapidities V1 to Vn. And then you, uh, by changing the boundary condition, you just let the, the, uh, the atoms uh, expand along a one-dimensional line. And so uh, initially the atoms will collide. And because of uh, the collisions are complicated processes, so the, uh, the, the, there are some complicated things going on here. But um, uh, after some sufficiently large time, the atoms will just be uh, order, uh, ordered uh, according to their velocity. So uh, the, 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 the one with the smallest uh, velocity will be on the leftmost position, the one with the uh, uh, the, the fastest one would be at the rightmost position. And when, when they are ordered, then they don't interact anymore, because, simply because uh, they will just keep expanding forever without, uh, without colliding. And so the, the, at this point, the velocities do not change anymore. So these asymptotic velocities are at large time, uh, they turn out to be exactly the, the rapidities. So exactly the rapidities that were labeling the eigenstate at time zero. Um, and uh, similarly to, to what I said for the, for the toy model I was using in the introduction, so we can define a, a rapidity distribution uh, like this. Okay, so uh, just a, a little bit more about expansion. So um, the fact that uh, the rapidities are also the asymptotic velocities uh, after expansion, this is something that has been um, um, advertised and used by many theorists. But uh, recently, it has been uh, it has been measured experimentally. So, uh, in the, in a in a prep, in a sorry in a paper published in Science a few months ago by the group of David Weiss. So, uh, so you can really measure the rapidities now experimentally. So, what what the, what these people did is that they um, did more or less what I what I explained. So, they prepared this, the gas in in some state here and then um, let the gas expand in 1D. And after uh, several, at some time, they just measure the distribution of uh, velocities of the atoms. So for instance, along this time slice, it would correspond to the violet, to the first violet curve here. Uh, and then uh, at, at the next time slice, it would be the blue line. Uh, at the next time slice, it would be the green one and so on. And um, so, you see that the, the distribution of velocities uh, uh, evolves uh, with the expansion time, but for sufficiently long uh, expansion time, it does not evolve anymore. And at this point, uh, what you are measuring or what they are measuring is uh, really the rapidity distribution in the initial state. Uh, so really it's, it's something that, uh, it's not just a, uh, you know, it's not just a quantity that shows up in the mathematical solution of the model. It's, it's really something that experimentalists can uh, measure now. So this is the experimental data that they had, and this is comparison with, uh, with theory. All right, um, now uh, let me come back to losses. Uh, so again, we are interested in describing losses in that gas uh, in the regime where the loss rate is uh, much smaller than uh, any relaxation time in the system. And uh, in the quantum system, uh, what, what this uh, means is that we can describe uh, at the level of the Lindblad equation, we can just assume that uh, the density matrix of the system at any time t is uh, stationary. So, so uh, it commutes with the Hamiltonian and also it commutes with conserved charges. So we, if we have some conserved charge Q, uh, then it will also commute to the density matrix uh, under that assumption. And then we can uh, just uh, write a simple uh, evolution equation for the slow uh, drift of the conserved charges, um, so, which takes this form. So it relates the time derivative of the expectation value of Q in the system to uh, an operator to the expectation value of 
an operator that is made out of Q and out of uh, Psi to the K, which is the operator that uh, removes K atoms um, at the same position. All right, and, and then if you apply, if you just apply this to the rapidity distribution itself, which is a conserved charge uh, in the system, then uh, you find this equation, which is the one I advertised uh, in, the, in the introduction, where uh, this functional of rho now is given by the expectation value uh, of this operator, uh, taken in a state, in a macro state that is parameter, or generalized Gibbs ensemble, if you want, uh, parameterized by the, by the rapidity distribution. Uh, okay, so you have to do this for, uh, for a finite resolution sigma just to make things more uh, well-defined and, and ultimately you want to take the limit to sigma goes to uh, zero. All right, so this defines the problem. And then, uh, and then what we want to do, is, of course, is to uh, evaluate this uh, functional f. So, um, okay, so uh, analytically, it's a, it's a very hard problem. Um, so we were able to do it uh, so far only in in the two easy asymptotic uh, regimes uh, where the gas is uh, maps to a free uh, to a gas of non-interacting particles. So um, first in the in the regime where the where we have essentially free bosons. So when the energy per atom is much larger than uh, than the repulsion energy and the scattering energy, the the atoms behave like uh, like free bosons. And then in that case, you can see that. It's very easy to see that the functional f is just proportional to rho directly. That's simply because you have non-interacting particles. So if you, if you just remove one particle randomly or a bunch of particles randomly, then uh, the probability that uh, you would do that uh, is just proportional to the, to, the density, to the density itself. And then there's an interesting combinatorial factor, uh, which is k times k factorial, which just uh, expresses the fact that there are k atoms lost at each event, and uh, k factorial is the, is the k body uh, k body correlation uh, evaluated in uh, for free bos for uh, free bosons. Okay, uh, so that's uh, very simple. Now, uh, slightly less simple and uh, much more interesting is the hardcore regime. So the regime where uh, when the energy per atom is much uh, smaller this time than the scattering energy. So the so the, the particles behave like uh, hardcore bosons, which can be mapped to free fermions. However, the mapping uh, from bosons to fermions is not local. And, uh, and as a result, uh, you find a non-trivial result for the functional f. So, uh, okay, so the formula is what it is, uh, but uh, what I want to emphasize is that um, uh, it is both uh, nonlinear, nonlinear in the rapidity distribution, because you see there's some rho squared here, and uh, it's also non-local in rapidity sp space, meaning that uh, the functional f at rapidity v depends on uh, the distribution rho of w for any w, not just for w close to v, but uh, for really for any w. So it's a complicated object in, in general. Uh, that's, the, that, that's, the, uh, that's what it means. Um, all right, and uh, away from these asymptotic uh, uh, non-interacting regimes, um, one has to rely on numerics. And for this, we've implemented um, a, a summation of, over beta states, uh, which is the technique that has been developed by Jean-Sébastien Co and, and uh, several collaborators over the years. Um, and um, so essentially we are, uh, we are comp comp computing that uh, double sum. Uh, so it's a sum over uh, eigenstates before the loss here and uh, eigenstates after the loss here with uh, some probability distribution which is taken, uh, which is defined out of the, of the form factor of uh, psi k, uh, the operator that uh, removes k atom at the same position. And um, yeah, okay, uh, so for this we are relying on some algebraic beta ansatz formulas by uh, Lorenzo Piroli and Pasquale Calabrese. And uh, with that distribution over pairs of eigenstates, we have to evaluate the, the difference between the rapidity distribution before and after the loss uh, weighted by the k-body correlation. And so for this, we are also using an algebraic beta ansatz uh, uh, formula, uh, this time by Bolash-Poshka. Um, okay, so 
we did this. Uh, this is what the, the results typically look like. So for instance, if we start here from a, a rapidity from the, the equilibrium rapidity distribution, so the one of thermal equilibrium, which is the violet uh, one here for some parameters, uh, then we can calculate the corresponding functional f, which is a, so the corresponding one is the, is the violet one here. And then uh, since we can calculate the functional f, uh, we can uh, evolve the rapidity distribution as a function of time. And this is what is shown here after 5% losses, 10% losses, 15% losses, and so on. For uh, k equals one, so one body correlations, two body correlations, three body correlations. So it works. It works, this method works, but it's computationally heavy. Like to, to get these curves, uh, took, uh, it took a few days. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's heavy and it's not very convenient for practical purposes. Um, okay, so I guess my time is up. So uh, let me just uh, quickly summarize. So for slow losses, so for when the loss rate is uh, small compared to relaxation in the system, um, then uh, we have we uh, you easily get uh, this equation here and uh, to to describe the losses and um, and the big challenge is to evaluate this functional f that's the big thing. Uh, so in this recent preprint, we were able to get it analytically in simple asymptotic regimes. Um, even in these simple asymptotic regimes, the result can be highly non-trivial and uh, and in general. Um, you can do it numerically, but uh, we need to, we, if you really want to do something, uh, something useful for, with this, uh, you ne we, need to, we need to improve the, the numerics because it's, it's, uh, it takes, it's taking too much time at the moment. Um, okay, so there are many open questions, I think, uh, uh, on this uh, topic. So there have been uh, works in the cold atom community uh, in the past years. Uh, especially on the quasi-condensate regime, and we have not made uh, the, the link with between what we did here and and these works, so that remains to be done. And um, also, uh, okay, so recently there have been uh, several works um, by several people uh, in this audience uh, on uh, the effect of weak integrability breaking, uh, which is essentially uh, the same as, as what I explained. Uh, so they they looked at different uh, mechanisms for integrability breaking. So not losses, but but very similar similar uh, mechanisms. And um, and there have been so the, analogously to what I said, they have um, uh, some functionals f that they need to calculate. And and some people have developed uh, approximations to do that, or 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 analytical schemes to do that. Uh, uh, especially these two papers by uh, Friedman, Gopala, Krishnan, Wasser, and uh, and um, Bastianello, Denard, Steluca, where they um, uh, used some tricks to truncate uh, uh, truncate uh, the sum of over form fa form factors to evaluate this function. So, would be I don't think these methods uh, apply to uh, losses, but still, uh, since we really need uh, some. Uh, analytical insights it, it's, uh, it would be really uh, useful to to see if any of these uh, other uh, related works uh, is uh, helpful here so uh, analytical progress is, is really needed and uh, there's room for uh, for uh, there's room for for more wor work uh, uh, there uh, and uh, that's it thank you thanks a lot John uh so yeah we have we have some time for questions me? Yeah. Okay. me yes okay so just uh, i mean one maybe one thing you could use uh, it's the low density approximation for these form factors but then uh, it would be easier and but actually how do you in the in when you showed the convergence i mean when you did the calculation with uh, some you know all these things how do you check the i mean you have to check that you're including all, uh, all the relevant uh, excitations right like uh, in uh we, we are not choosing the excitations it's a it's a mark of chain we are building a mark a mark of chain and we're so we, we just need to check that it's equilibrated uh, and that we did so 
it's not it's not uh it's not we are not reorganizing the sum in terms of particle hole excitations okay, okay. so we've checked that uh, we've checked that it's equilibrated so that the markov chain is long enough and we've also checked that uh, it's converged with uh, system size okay Okay, so we have one question from Dimitri Kiangart. Hi. Hi. You have one question, I mean. Yes, just a second. Uh, one moment, I read that it was uh, someone else was trying to, uh, Dimitri was trying to ask a question. Yes, so can I? No. Okay. Okay, so wait until the break. I lost. Uh, sorry. Um, so, so can I ask a question? Or? Um, yes, maybe. And maybe Dimitri, can you type your question since you have a sound problem? Okay, please have it. Yeah. Okay. So no, it's a, just a question. I mean, you you, you just write on the link that again, which sort of looks like a natural description. But I mean, you know, how physically is that assumption actually? The assumption that it's Markovian. You yeah, mean? well, you write down a little plugin for that particular process, right? I mean, so I mean, is that uh, you know what I mean? I mean I well, mean, okay. So we had many discussion with uh, discussions about this with my co-authors. Um, so, okay, I will give you my personal opinion about this. So for me, Aline Bladian is just the most uh, general uh, equation, Markovian equation that you can write for a density matrix um, that preserves, uh, you know, the trace and the positivity, and uh, and that's it. So it can't be anything else as long as you as long as you assume that it's Markovian. Now you can discuss whether or not it should be Markovian, but uh, I think at least for losses in in cold atom gases, it's it's well accepted that it's, uh, it's Markovian. Now the other assumption that the rate is small compared to uh, relaxation that's uh, that's uh, probably uh, less uh, well justified I would say and uh, indeed in cold atoms people have studied a lot like things like the Zeno effect or um, which which clearly goes beyond uh, what we are doing uh, here that would be higher order in gamma if you want yeah. mm -hmm. But I think Markov. I think just assuming that it's Markovian, I don't think this is uh, really a, a problem. Okay. Okay. So, do we have like one very very quick question? May I? Super quick. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, and uh, may I ask uh, if there is a simple physical interpretation why the losses in the top regime are not diagonal in the rapidity space. In the end, the particles are not interactive, so I can't really understand uh, how it came out. Can, I completed uh, the result, but I'm missing the physical picture. Can you, can you repeat, please? I, I oh, didn't... Sorry. Is there a simple uh, physical explanation why the losses uh, in the Tonks uh, Giordano regime are not diagonal in the rapidities? Why they couple different Yes, rapidities? it's because uh, it's because you are it's because of the jordan wigner string so it's because you uh, even though the gas is a gas of non-interacting fermions if you want or it maps to a gas of non-interacting fermions you are removing a boson so and, and when you remove a boson you are doing two things you remove a fermion but you also change the boundary conditions or if you want you apply a jordan wigner string too so yeah, it's like you're you're removing a particle but you're also somehow uh, shaking all the others and and, and this th this results in a in a non-trivial uh, 